With the way season 6 was going, it was shaping up to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest, season opening in the history of the show. The first three episodes are some of the highest rated episodes of the entire series. We left off the third episode, Thank You, with quite possibly a major character death, but there were a lot of questions floating around the internet. Theories about what actually happened in this scene, and if Glenn truly was dead or alive. So viewers were excited to see what happens next. The Horde of Walkers are heading towards Alexandria, everybody is still more or less split up, and Glenn could possibly be dead. The pacing was going so smoothly, the action was non-stop, but when we tuned into the next episode, it wasn't about any of this stuff. There was barely any Alexandria, no Walker Horde, no answers to Glenn's whereabouts, instead we got a full episode focused on Morgan's backstory. And this wasn't necessarily a bad thing, everybody really wanted to see how Morgan turned from this crazed individual to the peaceful man that he is now, but having this episode come off the heels of a major cliffhanger didn't exactly give this episode a lot of room to stand on. It was almost like this episode was placed on quicksand in the lineup of the episodes for season 6. You start off excited to watch it, but as you realize what it is and how it won't actually answer any of the questions you had regarding the last episode, you start having this sinking feeling. So this made Here's Not Here a pretty controversial episode among Walking Dead fans. But now that it's been a few years, is this episode still controversial? Explaining Morgan's backstory is something that everybody wanted to see, so if we look past where this episode was placed in the series, is it actually one of the series' best episodes? Or does it deserve this pretty standard ranking amongst Walking Dead episodes? In today's video, I'm going to be recapping this episode and answering those questions. I'll break down some of the themes and messages of the episode, and overall my thoughts on the legacy this episode left the show with. So grab a stick, milk a goat, and prepare for the journey ahead with Season 6, Episode 4, Here's Not Here. We start the episode off in present time, in Alexandria. Morgan is talking to somebody off camera, and based on the conversation, we can deduct that he's talking to the leader of the wolves, and Morgan says he's gonna tell him a story. So we pick up with Morgan where we left him off in season three during the episode clear. Morgan is yelling at seemingly no one, saying, you know you were supposed to, and in his anger, he seemingly forgets that the entire place is now on fire. So Morgan heads out, off into the wilderness, taking out any walk or anybody that he comes across, the camera adding in some intentional blur to emphasize his craziness. But he still carries on his duty of lighting those that he killed on fire, still repenting for his sins and punishing himself for the life he thinks he deserves. Morgan gets attacked by walkers that night, so in the morning he starts building a perimeter around his new base camp. As he heads out searching for new supplies, he catches two people trying to sneak up on him. So he runs ahead, springing a trap for them when they finally catch up, screaming the same thing at them that he was screaming earlier in the episode. So he continues carrying out this life, marking his sayings on trees and rocks all around him. As Morgan is walking through the woods, he hears a goat. Going to try and take the goat, he comes across a cabin in the woods. A man calls out to him, asking him to put the goat down and speaking calmly. Morgan responds by trying to shoot him. This voice warns Morgan to put the gun down so that way they can work this out, but Morgan won't listen. This time around, the man gets the jump on Morgan and knocks him out. Morgan wakes up in a cage, and the man tries to speak with him once again. He asks him what his name is, and Morgan just says, kill me. That's a stupid name. It's dangerous. You should change it. He continues screaming this, and the man gives him his name. Eastman. He also throws Morgan a book called The Art of Peace. So Morgan watches Eastman through the bars of his cell. He protects the cabin by the use of his stick, trains with it, and tries unsuccessfully to make some dairy products from the goat. Eastman talks to Morgan, telling him he was a psychiatrist from Atlanta, and he decided if people who were locked up should be sent free. Morgan says it's his job to clear anybody and anything that stands in his way. The next day, Morgan tries his best to look for a way to escape. Eastman comes in and actually makes some leeway with getting through to Morgan. He diagnoses him with PTSD and figures out why that is. 
that he saw his loved ones pass away, but Morgan also saved people. As an audience, we know both of these things are true. Eastman says that he's only ever met one true evil person, and the rest were either born with bad brains or got lost along the way, just like Morgan. He also tells Morgan that the door has been open the whole time, so he has two choices. He can leave or he can stay. Those are the two options, killing Eastman isn't an option. So Morgan of course opts for the unofficial option three, to which Eastman I kicked your ass earlier. Well, that's how I redirected your ass and Morgan chooses to go back in the cell. During their fight, Morgan accidentally broke a picture on the wall, and Eastman talks about his daughter, how she gave him a rabbit's foot for good luck, and Morgan starts to realize what he's done. The next day, Eastman says he's going out to look for supplies for a trip that they're going on. Where the trip is, even Eastman doesn't know. He offers for Morgan to come, but Morgan stays silent. So Eastman leaves, and Tabitha the goat starts crying when walkers approach. Morgan chooses to go outside and take out the walkers, dragging them over to a makeshift graveyard where Eastman buries the dead. Eastman approaches and thanks Morgan for saving Tabitha. He also takes the wallet from the dead and writes their name on the headstone. Back at the cabin, Eastman says that Morgan has to fix the garden, and then he gives Morgan a stick of his own. We then get an old school training montage of Eastman training Morgan the ways of the stick, Morgan reading the book and getting progressively more comfortable getting away from the cage and giving it to Tabitha. They have dinner that night and Eastman tells the story of the one true evil man he's ever known, Crichton Dallas Wilton, a charismatic and true sociopath. He tells him how he was up for parole, seemed like a true changed man, but Eastman saw right through his act and sent him away for life. But Crichton escaped, murdered Eastman's family, and turned himself back in. He escaped solely to ruin Eastman's life. So Eastman built the cell to hold him there, but he has since come to think that all life is precious. The next day, they need more supplies, and Morgan takes Eastman to his previous spot. Eastman asks Morgan about his past, and he tells him everything. Eastman critiques Morgan on his stick form when a walker approaches. Morgan goes to take him out, but it's one of the men he killed earlier in the episode, and the panic sets in. Eastman has to intervene, and gets bit. This causes Morgan to slip back to his previous mental state, yelling crazy things like, I said not here, and attacking Eastman. Eastman attacks and yells back, saying that Morgan has come back from this and that he shouldn't be acting this way. He takes the body and leaves, telling Morgan that here's not here. So Morgan continues his old ways, getting his old stick back and going through the woods killing anything and everything he comes across, until he stumbles upon a couple one of whom is on crutches. Frightened of Morgan, the woman takes out a can of chicken noodle soup and a bullet and leaves it on the ground. They walk away, and Morgan realizes that Eastman was right. All life is precious. He returns to Eastman, who's burying the body, and Eastman reveals that he did in fact capture Crichton and locked him in the cell. It took 47 days for him to starve to death, but it didn't bring him peace. After all of that, the world went to shit, and Eastman was exactly in the same mind said as Morgan, but he came back. So Morgan buries Eastman and Tabitha and sets off towards, of all places, Terminus. Back in the present day, we see that Morgan was in fact talking to the leader of the wolves, but even after that story, it didn't change his perspective. The wolf says he's still gonna kill everybody here if he gets out, and Morgan realizes that he might have his own Crichton Dallas Wilton on his hands, right before he hears Rick Grimes screaming to open the gate, and the episode ends. So how has this episode aged in my opinion? I honestly think quite well. When watching this episode standalone, it works far better than it did when it interrupted the pacing of the season. Some people consider this to be the best episode of The Walking Dead, but I think it's rated this poorly, and this isn't even that poor of a score compared to the episodes of like season 8, but I truly think that a lot of these scores are here because of where it came in the series. This is a beautiful and tragic standalone story of one of the best characters in The Walking Dead. This is also an extended episode, so it explains to a very satisfying degree how Morgan went from this crazy person we met in Season 3 to this peaceful nomad in Season 6. Nothing about this episode feels rushed, and the story of both Morgan and Eastman are really well done. One of the best aspects of this episode are the callbacks and revelations. There were many, oh, so that's how that happened, moments like with Morgan getting the training from the stick, and the book about 
about peace, but also the story of Eastman's daughter and the rabbit's foot. In the season 5 finale, when Morgan goes toe to toe with the wolves, he puts them in a car and smiles when he sees a rabbit's foot dangling from the car window. This scene didn't really make a whole lot of sense at the time, but with the context of this episode, it now shows us what Morgan was thinking, and he was thinking of Eastman at that time. And while the season 5 finale might have only been 4 episodes ago, it was almost a full year before this episode aired on TV, so it showed that they were planning Morgan's backstory and had it all thought out well in advance. This is kind of a testament to how well written this whole story was, and how the show as a whole was written at that time. I'm not too sure if they filmed this episode, or like the majority of it a while ago, that could definitely be the case, and they had already filmed it by the time they were filming the season 5 finale, but everybody always harks on Walking Dead's writing, so I'm gonna give the writing a compliment here and keep things positive. On top of these revelations, there were some callbacks, like when Morgan says, don't ever be sorry, and that's exactly what he said to Carl when he met him back in the episode clear. And one of the bigger, either callbacks, easter eggs, unanswered questions, whatever you want to title this, are the references to A and B. Morgan writes the letter A on a tree during his crazed state, and Eastman says A and B to Morgan in this scene. A and B. A. You broke the garden fence, laid waste to a perfectly good tomato plant. Another mention on A and B that I had completely forgotten about, so that's pretty cool. One of the highlights of the episode is of course the character of Eastman played by John Carroll Lynch. While only having an appearance in this single episode, Eastman is up there with one of the better written characters in the entire show. He's of course a very important aspect to the character and the journey of Morgan, but he also has his own complete character arc over the course of this episode's 60 minute runtime. Being a man of peace and trying to help others because he wants them to avoid the same mistakes he's made in his past is a really great character to have in a post-apocalyptic story, and one of the few people left in the world who's mostly morally good. John Carroll Lynch usually plays these really creepy roles like possibly the Zodiac Killer in Zodiac and Twisty the Clown in American Horror Story, but he plays a genuine good guy in this role and proves that he's a pretty great actor all around. Eastman talks about how he was a psychiatrist and decided whether or not people could get a parole and ultimately be sent free or stay in prison. And out of his many years in that position, he's only ever met one truly evil person, and that's Crichton Dallas Wilton. Now, we don't ever see this character or anything of that nature, but the character itself is a pretty big metaphor for some of the foes in the show. We see that Morgan is talking to the wolf and trying to get him to leave the dark side, but he can't really get through to him no matter what. At the end of the episode, Morgan thinks that this wolf might be his own Crichton Dallas Wilton. But a few episodes later, we see that this isn't the case at all, because the wolf gives his life to save Denise, making him not true in total evil. Some of the bigger villains in the show also prove that they're not true in total evil. Negan gets his own redemption arc and backstory episode, Gareth said that they only turned to eating those who turned up because the place was overrun by a group of bad people, so who is the Crichton Dallas Wilton to the characters of the show? I have maybe two people that come to mind, and that's Joe from The Claimers, and mainly the governor. The governor proved that he was too far gone. He was given the opportunity for peace by Rick, and he still chose violence. Eastman says that everybody was either born with bad brains or got lost along the way, and most of the characters we meet got lost along the way, but the governor didn't get lost along the way. You could argue that he was born with a bad brain, but I think it actually makes more sense that he's true evil. If you listen to what Eastman says about Crichton, he says that he was a very very charismatic individual, getting into the heads of all those around him and ultimately getting them to support him, and this sounds a lot like the governor who built an entire community lost it, and still got more supporters only a few months later. So while this might be a little out of order, you'd expect that the next Crichton Dallas Wilton would come after this episode, I think he actually came before, and that the true evil of the show, according to Eastman's standards, was the governor. Now this episode is titled, Here's Not Here, and that's a pretty confusing phrase. When Morgan and Eastman get into their fight, Morgan says that he didn't want to practice here, and Eastman says, well Morgan, here's not here. 
But what does this actually mean? Like a lot of things in The Walking Dead, it's kind of open to interpretation. I even tried looking for the actual explanation, but everybody has kind of come up with their own theories, and I like that better. Some of the theories I saw involved Eastman's conversation about PTSD, how everything seems very real in front of you, yet you feel disconnected. So here, where you are, is not actually here if that makes sense. Another person associated it with Morgan and his self-inflicted penance. How Morgan eventually got driven crazy, not over the death of his son and wife, but that everybody around him died too, and he didn't know why. In the house, in the episode Clear, Morgan has written on the walls all the different ways people have died, and not all of them are due solely to walker bites. As an audience, we know that the virus is airborne, but Morgan didn't know that, so he started seeing everybody around him turn into flesh-eating monsters, he became more and more insane. So another form of PTSD, and Morgan thinking that he's in his own personal hell, here's not really here. Other theories stated that it means your past problems are only your present problems if you let them be, and I like that one. And then I saw one about how here's not here means people aren't welcome. The expression we're here means that they're welcome, and here's not here means that they aren't welcome. Apparently this is like a semi-common expression, I've never heard it and I don't really think it has anything to do with this episode. Overall, this is one of the better episodes to watch if you're just looking for an episode of The Walking Dead to watch, and you can just throw this one on. It's very self-contained and doesn't need a ton of understanding to know what's going on. I think that this episode and Here's Negan are both very similar, the only difference being that Here's Negan was an additional episode, so it's rated highly, and this one broke the pacing of the season, so it's rated lower. What are your thoughts on Here's Not Here? Let me know down in the comments below and which episode you want me to cover next. If you enjoyed this video, remember to leave a like and subscribe for more content like this. Special thanks to my channel members, you guys are the absolute best, and you guys are the first to see this video. So if you want to see videos early like them, become a channel member. You get lots of exclusive perks depending on the tier, so check it out by hitting that join button. Special thanks to these guys right here, and I'll see you all in the next one. Yeah.